You know a dream is like a river, ever changing as it flows. And a dream is just a vessel that must follow where it goes. Trying to learn from what's behind and never knowing what's in store makes each day a constant battle or just a stay between the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am the blind blogger, Maxwell Ivey, and this is another episode of What's Your Excuse? where I uh, hope to inspire you to, uh, to stop making those excuses, to get past those roadblocks, and start improving your life. And I'll do that by bringing you interviews with people who have overcome adversity or thrived in spite of difficult life circumstances, people who have struck out and started their own businesses, and experts who can offer proven real world advice to help you on your journey. And you can find me at theblindblogger.net or reach out to me at just ask at theblindblogger.net. Um, I also want to mention my sponsor, the uh, my friends Chip and Pam Edwards at createmyvoice.com. Uh, I've known them for over a year now. They helped me get my website, my blog, and my podcast out there where they can be heard, enjoyed, followed on Alexa and Google and all the new wireless speakers that are coming out. Uh, if you're not already on Alexa and Google, you really should do something about that because you're missing the opportunity to reach millions of potential new fans, customers, clients. And so go over to createmyvoice.com and reach out to Chip and Pam. They will definitely help you out with that. Now today, my guest is Kat McLeod. And I love the email I got from her when she was interested in coming on my show. It said, do you think your audience would want to hear from a former dominatrix, successful six-figure uh, businesswoman, and someone who, ha who, who now teaches others to start their own businesses? And of course, I love that. Um, and then I started reading her bio. Um, Kat has started a male fetish business when she was in her 20s and used that to to purchase an amazing home for her and her family um she eventually got tired of that business and closed it she went and got a, a degree in psychology she started helping sex workers start their own uh, businesses she became a stay-at-home mom but got tired of that too or at least doing solely that uh, and so she then started helping women so that they can start businesses that allow them uh, to be successful financially, but also still be moms. So I really love her. You can find her at S A H, uh, stay at home mom. So S A H M entrepreneur.com. I'm sorry about that, Pam. Thank you. And, and welcome to What's Your Excuse. Hi. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> it's Kat. <laughs> it's Kat. I'm sorry. Um, well, one thing I tell my followers is, is this is recorded live, which means the same things can happen on an actual live broadcast. And my brand is all about, um, there's, there's no shame and mistakes. So it's not like we're going to edit that stuff out. So how are you doing today, Kat? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I have had the opportunity to have one amazing interview this morning, and now I'm looking forward to a great conversation with you. And and then who knows what the rest of the day will bring. So it's pretty good. Um, so I think I did a pretty good job of, of covering your background, but I'm, I'm just trying to think which thing I want to ask about first, because like, uh, like my own story, there seems to be quite a bit to it. Um, I guess, why don't you start with the fact that you were once uh, a dominatrix and op operated a fetish business and, how long did it take you before you finally get, you got tired of that enough to the point to want to do something different? Okay, so Max, well, did give a synopsis of my life story, not in exact order, so it sounds a little okay. bit different right there. So we'll just clarify that I <laughs> that I didn't have that fetish business when I had a family. It was a long time before I had a family, so I'll go into a little background 
that Maxwell brought up about what his entire podcast is about overcoming and not having excuses. I grew up in an extremely abusive home. I was beaten on a regular basis and grew up fearing for my life and being told I was worthless and nothing. And I really believed it. I was a child and I truly believed it. And I was quite screwed up in my teens and early 20s. I moved out to Los Angeles. I'm just shortening the story. And I answered an ad to be a dominatrix. I did enjoy it for the first about six to nine months because it turned the tables on the power. And I got to act out some of the abuse that I felt, but in a you know consensual environment. And it was fun and different. And I was 22. And it was cool at the time to explore different things. And I quickly burned out of that business because it was mentally tolling and I just did not find it enjoyable anymore. So I decided to use my college degree, thought I was going to go and get a normal quote unquote job, but I decided to keep the elements of my dominatrix business that I most enjoyed. But that was about 5% or so of that business. Never thought I could make any real money with it. And that's how at the age of 22, I found out the niches truly are in the richest because once I niched down to that specific fetish inside of the world of BDSM and domination, my business exploded and I wound up becoming a multiple six figure business owner from the age of 22 to 27. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess that's proof that um, when you hear people complain about they, they can't enter a field because there's the, the field is saturated, there's already too many people doing it. Um, what you did there is proof that if you just find a specific enough uh, focused part of that, of that uh, arena that you can still be successful in it. It, that is true. I mean, I can't generalize it to all different industries, but it was true for that industry at that time period. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now you, um, you, you did have the psychology degree before you started work and before you started your businesses? I had a undergraduate degree my undergraduate degree that I graduated and then I became a dominatrix and after I left my after I closed down my fetish business and did a brief stint in corporate, which I did really well at, but I did not enjoy because I am an entrepreneur and do not like having somebody telling me what to do and having a boss and being micromanaged and being in office every day. I decided to go back to graduate school and get my master's in psychology because during all of this time period from my late I guess it would be early 20s. During all of my 20s, I did a lot of therapy to get my head on halfway straight, and I wanted to get my master's in psychology. And as my second year in graduate school program, I chose to help women transition out of the sex industry. I knew what it was like to make hundreds, if not thousands of dollars an hour, and how difficult it is to transition out of that industry where you're used to that kind of money into regular life. And in order to do this successfully, I found that women were willing to to transition into entrepreneurship so they still had control of their own time their own schedule and the key was finding the intersection of their skills their passions their talents that would make them the most money for the time spent the money almost mo every situation was not the same as being in the sex industry and they had to accept that in order to transition out but they still were not going to for peanuts yeah, I, I, I can only, I, I'm following your logic there. It's if, if you're going to convince someone to, to move on to a different line of work, you're going to have to show them that they can either make the same amount of money or receive enough in personal satisfaction to outweigh a difference in income. But usually it comes down to, can I do something else where I can make the same or close to the same kind of money? That wasn't the case in that situation because I did not try to convince them. These were pe women who wanted to transition out, probably wow. tried numerous times on their own, just like I had, where I had tried numerous times to quit the industry that and the lure of that easy, quote unquote, easy money kept bringing me back. So these were women who already decided that they wanted to transition out and we needed to figure out the best way for them to do so, so they didn't fall back backwards to the lure of that money. Right. 
And uh, one of the things I noticed in the, in the email is, is you say that um, you can help just about anybody in, with, um, turn their, their hobby or their interest into a, into a business. And as you specialize in showing these moms how to create these sex, successful businesses in a very small amount of time per day or per week. So could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes, this is 15 years after helping, no, 13 years after first helping women transition out of the sex industry. So an entire over a decade's gone by and my life has drastically changed. I'm living a true dream life. And my business nowadays is focused on pampered stay-at-home moms like myself who are not done sharing their skills, their passions, their gifts with the world. However, we want to remain mom first. So my framework that I developed helping women transition out of the sex industry with that high capital for the time spent, I still use to this day for my pampered stay-at-home moms because we have full-time mom jobs we don't get paid for called mom. And when we work, I create businesses that are designed to be done in two hours or less a day. A full-time, full-time mom job, the maximum I have any of my clients ever work is 20 hours a week. The more usual is 15 hours or less a week. And that entails, just like you said, we take their passions, their skills, their gifts, oftentimes skills that they had in previous careers, sometimes hobbies that they do, and we niche them down really deep, like you just talked about, where you can break out of a saturated field. We niche them down really deep to the subset of that business idea that's going to bring them the most money for the time spent. An example of this is one of my first clients. She learned how to bake from her mom. Never thought this could be turned into a viable business. We niched her down to gluten-free baking for children's birthday parties and baby showers here in Los Angeles. And people pay a premium for this. So she, her first package starts out at $300. This is meaningful for her because both her mom and her sister have celiac disease. And another client, she was a lawyer for the city of Los Angeles. She did not want to keep her law hours and miss out on raising her three kids. So we have her niched into a subset of immigration law and she's able to work two days a week and make more than the US average and all the way onto my online clients who who were working corporate, so they weren't pampered stay-at-home moms. They were working corporate and they want to be pampered stay-at-home moms. So we took some of their skills, like one of my clients, she's really good at software. So she knows how to do tech stuff and she specializes in a certain software program that helps busy service-based providers keep track of their client work, take on more clients, make more money. And she's able to work four days a month and replicate the salary that she was making in corporate, doing the same kind of work for herself instead of the company. Okay, now um, these women that are able to make this money in, in less hours, um, I, don't, I don't want you to, to give, away, give away everything, but is, is there, are there a couple of things that these women do that the rest of us are aren't or that uh, they're not doing that the rest of us are doing that uh, that allow them to be so successful in such a small amount of time or is it or does it have something to do with the with the um, um with the skills that come from uh, from being a mom <laughs> you would like to think that right with the organization skills i think a part of it does have to do that moms are used to juggling busy schedules we have a tight amount of hours to squeeze in and with my framework it guides my clients step-by-step step through this process and we break down their most profitable skill. And more than that, we use something I call my 30 minute hyper-focus model. That means 30 minutes a day, you sit down and you only do what's on the roadmap to drive your business forward. So on the roadmap from A to Z and today's D to E, when you sit down to do that work, you do from D to E. You don't get distracted. You do only that. If you are already launched in your business and you want to acquire clients, you sit down for that half an hour and all you do is your client acquisition activities. So you don't waste any time on busy work. If you don't know what you do next, that's when you really have to invest in a mentor, a coach, a really solid self-study program and actually implement. I like 
like even better than that for my busy moms and anybody who is still in corporate who wants to start their own business, they can do my 15, 15, 15 hyper focus model. I really like this model. I use it myself. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at quiet lunchtime, 15 minutes in the evening. It's the same kind of thing. You sit down, you really focus, you, you, just bang it out what's next on your list or following up with clients, things that are going to move your business forward and or generate income and clients. And before you sit down for this model, you need to know where you're going. So that's when you're doing mundane work that we all do, like washing your hands at the sink. You think about what is coming next so that when you sit down for that sprint, you really do it. And we know it's way easier to focus in little chunks and we get so much more done when we sit down and just go and do it yeah i'm i'm assuming that your clients don't spend much time on social media or if they do they have it in focused uh periods that they allow themselves for for business that's correct otherwise you can get extremely lost in that scroll that's why that (laughs) being on social media in the scroll is not part of hyper focus time (laughs) (laughs) yes but we all feel like we have to have that time and, and that's okay. That time runs into much too much of that time. So uh, I actually thought I was doing really good with social media. And then I noticed that um, when I would read a news article that I would get lost in the comments of a news article. So I had to stop reading news articles for a while. Uh, so it's about, so you want them to think about what, what goals they have to accomplish in those 15 or 30 minutes while they're doing the mundane things, uh, where their mind doesn't have to be totally occupied with what they're doing. That's right. So when they sit down, they know exactly where they're going. And that goes back to having a roadmap that they know is going to lead in results. That's either implemented with a mentor, a business coach, or a really solid self-study course. All right. Now, um, do you and your clients, uh, y'all do this from from memory or from lists or from apps, or does it just depend on who you're working with? When I work with my clients, we have a customized roadmap. It's based on my stay-at-home mom entrepreneur framework, and it's okay. customized for each client, so they know exactly what's on the agenda for that week. Okay. All righty. Um, well, I'm talking with Kat McLeod, and you can find her at uh, sahmentrepreneur.com. Um, what has been uh, what has been your biggest uh, struggle of being an entrepreneur? I mean, I'm sure it's changed over the years, but uh, was there was there a time that you weren't sure if you were going to be an entrepreneur, or is this always the way you saw yourself? I've always been an entrepreneur. I was the child selling blow pop lollipops that I bought at the grocery store for a quarter, carrying them around my backpack and being known for having those at school. I was the child selling my best (laughs) friend's candy bars that her mom used to purchase for like, I think 40 cents at the time I was going door to door selling those suckers for a quarter because, you know, kids don't understand that you're losing money. (laughs) It was money in my pocket. (laughs) Yeah, you weren't losing you weren't losing the money. Your friend wasn't losing the mother. Her, her, her mom, your was. mom was losing right. the money. I mean, kids don't understand that parents don't pay money, that parents pay money for that stuff. At the time, I didn't understand that. So the bottom line is, I believe I've always been an entrepreneur. That doesn't mean entrepreneurship isn't without any struggle. So you asked about struggle. So in my first business, the struggle was I was making a lot of money yet I did not feel purposeful or meaningful in my work. I wound up hating it, but I was felt trapped with the money. Now, when I create businesses with people, fulfillment, purpose, meaningful work comes first, and then I marry that with high profit. I won't work with people who are just about the money at this point in my life. So that was one thing that I had to overcome and and get used to. And another thing is when you're an entrepreneur like myself, then self-trust comes into play. I'm, I'm the one making the decisions. I'm the one making, calling the shots, and I'm the one that makes the mistakes. And self-trust comes into play. It's something that I still work on to this day 20 years later. Right. Um, so you've only, um, 
you, you mentioned at this point in your life, you don't work with people who it's all about the money. Um, I'm, I'm guessing then by that at some point you took clients on that were all about the money just to have the clients. Did you fall into that trap? Yes, definitely. My entire fetish business pretty much was that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, meant as a coach. I meant as a coach or helping, oh, helping me. Oh. Did you ever take on a client yes. that yes, you were like, it. I'm taking this person because I need the, the business, not because I believe in what they're doing. You know, it's, I mean, I didn't think of it that way. When I was a new business coach, after I graduated with my master's in psychology, I became a certified coach at the time. And I opened up my practice to both men and women. And I took the clients that came to me. I was not discriminatory. Like I didn't, I just took who, who was yes, you know, whoever said yes to me. And some of those clients really drain my energy. And I tend to get a little bit too wrapped up in my clients results and people had their own blocks and resistances, refused to do the mutually agreed upon work, refused to do stuff. And I kept pushing them towards it. I had too much of my own ego wrapped up into their results 13 years ago. It's still something I have to watch myself now for. I still am very results oriented and very type A. Now I will say no to clients. I had somebody want to work with me about a month ago and I just did not feel like it was a good fit to this day. It's still challenging for me to be honest about that. So I pretty much just say that I don't feel like this would be a good fit. This might be a better person for you based on what you're saying. I don't think I'm the best person to help you. And the truth is I didn't want to work with them because they had this very needy, grabby, desperate energy. And the business that they wanted to do is not something I personally believe in. It didn't feel of integrity with me for that particular person because of that needy, desperate, hungry energy. It just, the whole thing didn't work for me. So I, to, I'm picky about my clients now. I'm at that point in my life that I don't have to work ever again. And it, when I do, it needs to be, it, it has to feel good for me. Yeah. Um, I know that while I work with a lot of different people on their online media uh, publicity, I've realized that I do best with people who are, are more in the personal development and self-help than, than people who are in business or physical health. So it's just one of the things. Um, the other thing is, is I, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, you know, to understand the clients better when you first connect with them because I'm finding I'm more results, results oriented and so far, at least for right now, several of the people I'm working with, thankfully, are effort uh, oriented. So how do you figure out, is, is it all gut instinct or are there certain signs or certain phrases or words you can kind of look for when you're trying to eliminate the clients that are gonna suck your energy? I just go with the, it's just that piece on self-trust. I trust myself. Now with what you were talking about with results and effort oriented, I, I understand that. And I don't attach as much it with the results anymore because that is on my clients. I've had enough experience at this point in my life that I know that I know what I'm talking about. And some of my clients are going to excel and some of them aren't. And that's okay. That's on them and what they feel comfortable with and what they're limited with. Of course, I'm there to support them. And the vast, vast, vast majority of my clients are successful. And there are going to be the few that they just have too much internal blocks coming up and we have to work through that before results come in. They have too much stuff blocking their success. I think that's one of those hard, really hard lessons to learn is that you can do everything right as their coach and they may still not be successful. Yes. And you have to let it go because there's always going to be a subset of your clientele who they on the outside, they want to change and it's too scary for them or they're just not ready at this time. They like the idea of change rather than actually changing and doing the work that would take. Yeah, it's scary to do something different. It's scary to add into your life. It is. It's scary for people to reach for the dream life. Uh, I, um, I have to remind myself that it is scary. Um, I'm, I've often told people I'm not smart enough to be scared. There's a lot of things I've done in the last 10 or 11 years 
<laughs> in the two different business of businesses I've been involved in. And if I'd have had the first clue what I was doing, I wouldn't have done it, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I understand that I understand it's easy to get uh, to get comfortable with where you're at, no matter how painful where you're at may be. And taking that risk and doing something different is is scary. So I have to remind myself of that. I also, I also have to remind myself that not everybody um, has 20 something years experience um, asking people for stuff and not so not everybody is comfortable sticking their hand up and saying, you know, you should have me on your show or something to, similar to that. In order to be successful in my eyes, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the fear. It means that you feel it. And at a certain point, what you want is bigger than that fear. And you say, screw it. And you do it anyways. I mean, there is a huge <laughs> element of that for anything new, anything you want in your life that's outside of your comfort zone. So like you talked about, you could be painful, but you're safe because you're in that, that you're just used to it. If you want to step out of that, if you wait till you feel super secure about it and no pain and no fear about it, you're not going to ever move anywhere. It's you, your dream life is in all those uncomfortable steps that take to create that dream life. And I'm living proof of it. I just shared how I started out and I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And the last decade of my life has been, I've been living a dream life. Yeah. Um, you're definitely a, a good example that, um, that if we're willing to be uncomfortable and do that long enough that we can be, be really successful both in our personal and professional lives. Um, so, okay, um, for those of y'all who have no way of knowing this, we're having a little trouble with the audio, so I had to turn my screen reader off. So I don't really know what my computer's doing other than I think we're online. So at, when we get to about 620, could you let me know so I don't have to be worried about about uh, taking advantage of you and going beyond my time? Uh, sure. <laughs> right. As I told you before we started, part of my brand is, is I just do stuff. Uh, I, what is, one of my favorite expressions is, life ain't like the Olympics. They're not going to give or take away style points. So if I feel like I have to explain stuff to my audience so they know what I'm doing and there's no real good way to do that without stopping and starting or you know i mean just why not just tell them hey uh the screen reader wouldn't stop talking or wouldn't wouldn't talk softly enough so we had to turn it off so i would appreciate if you you know about 620 or 625 and then i can come up with a final question and we can close from there so um and i and i am very happy to be talking with kat um mcleod and you can find her at uh, sahmentrepreneur.com uh, is there, uh, is there something that you personally have thought about doing or want to do, but so far you haven't found the, 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 the impetus to go out and do it? No. No? No. no. <laughs> Nothing on your bucket list? There's things on my bucket list, but not because I don't have the impetus to do it. As far as okay. career or just life, like there's places we I want mean, to travel. Just, just, just anything. Just, I mean, just, just anything that you know, it, it that you're like, uh, I would would want to do this, whether they be business or you know, anything you want to share, where, you know, maybe you have a little bit of concern about it, because I find that when people listen to interviews with somebody who is, is killing it as much as you are, they they sometimes think, well, that's that person that could not be me. Well, I hear those people and I was you. I mean, I really suffered from depression and eating disorders and anxiety for much of my early 20s. And that's why I had that crap load of therapy I told you about. And I can truly say at this point in my life, there is nothing that is on my bucket list as far as career that I'm not currently in the action of doing. My next goal right now, which I'm in the middle of doing, is doing a self-study course so I can have one for people who are feeling stuck. Maybe they were drug users, they were in the sex industry, or they currently are, they are abused, wherever they are in life, so that they can get started figuring out their right business idea and being able to bring about that dream life for themselves as I have for myself. Maybe they're at the point where they can't afford a mentor or a coach. I want to have something for um, 
people in that situation. So that's what I'm currently working on. That's why I can confidently say no. Anything that I really truly put my mind to, I make a decision, I'm making it happen, and I do. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I like the, your approach that, you know, you're creating these courses so that um, people who maybe can't afford a mentor at this time can still uh, have some help getting unstuck. Um, I find that there are far too many coaches and mentors who are focused on five figures or six figures or seven figures. And if a client isn't at the point where they can do that, they will go to the, well, if you're not ready to invest in yourself, how can you expect to grow? And I, so I appreciate you offering the <laughs> various options and meeting people where they are. Well, Maxwell, that's a good point. My ideal client is a pampered stay at home mom. So that there's definitely no pressure on my end. <laughs> I would not pressure someone. I have heard of those techniques and maybe it is truthful for some people that that is holding them back from growing their business, but that is definitely not my ideal client. I've never used it and I never will plan on using that kind of technique. Well, I don't like it either. I've been on those free exploratory calls where that's usually the last thing they say to you. Um, but I, I, you know, I've just really, um, I'm disappointed in many of the other coaches because it seems like a lot of people got into the business of coaching um, as a way of generating, you know, very high income without any thought of, am I going to be providing value to the people I intend to work with or not? You know, I so hear what you're saying. And that's exactly why I only work with people who want to start purposeful and meaningful work and share their gifts with the world. That's good. I think more people need to include that in the description of their niche when they're deciding what market they're going to approach for their business. I, everyone's doing, everyone can, I mean, I'm coming from my standpoint and I'm not going to poo poo on all of those people because I don't know their life situations that have brought about them wanting to go to that place where they are, like you said, strong arming you at the end. Like, I don't know what they're about. That's definitely not what I'm about. And I do sometimes question people who became business coaches that never owned their own business. Again, I'm not trying to poop on people, but I, before I ever started the stay at home mom entrepreneur, I already have seven figure wealth way before I ever started the, my current business. That's where I can come from a place of abundance. And I do question people online giving major business advice who have never owned businesses. That just doesn't, Perp like that doesn't sit well with me. If they're still killing it, that's that's on them. I just personally wouldn't buy from a business coach who did not own businesses. Well, see, I didn't even ask that question, but that's a very good point. Um, <laughs> when people are considering who their mentor should be, you know, make sure they've actually operated a business and aren't just putting on a good show. Uh, well, you were talking about integrity. Well, what I what I surmised from your statement was integrity about not trying to strong arm people yes, and just yeah. up integrity and period. Well, you know, I'm pretty lucky here lately. It seems like I'm getting answers to questions I didn't ask, but they're to better questions than I was going to ask. So I'm happy. With, <laughs> so I'm happy. With, hey, you know, it's the things we don't plan and intend often turn out to be uh, very good, and sometimes they can surprise us and be you know, be even better than what we had planned to do. Um, two of my most visited pages on my, on my uh, blind blogger website, uh, one is a blog post, the other is a video, and both of them were not what I planned on them being, but they both get a lot of views because they were mistakes that after I realized I had done them and, and after people started pointing out the message that came from the mistake, I'm like, I got to leave this up, you know? So I appreciate you getting the idea of where I was going. Um, <clears throat> and there's one, one other thing, I, you know, you, you mentioned it. You wouldn't want to hire a business coach who had never operated a business. It seems like um, most of the really good coaches have been there and done that. They've been through the struggle of running a business or addressing their own uh, personal uh abuse or trauma or setbacks in their lives and they use that as the source of their of the place they come from when they do advise and coach people yeah i believe in that for sure i believe that you can absolutely use your story and make that part of your brand because you are your own brand definitely bring that into your 
workplace. It's, a, it's an easier place to connect. I think that the new marketing trend is moving to personal connections. Not that it ever moved away from that, but there was a time period where email marketing and all the webinars was so new and shiny and it really converted and now it seems like that's converting less and less and one-on-one -on -one connection and connecting with your audience is super important and part of that is sharing your story yeah um as i tell people all the time uh hosts don't book you your product or the service they book your story and you know, it is good to see that we're coming back around to connection even if the connections aren't in person and face to face so much anymore but uh it was there was a time uh for maybe five or six years ago with blogs and then with webinars where if you were willing to game the system you could be very successful financially in a short period of time i've heard about that heyday i was a full-time stay-at-home mom during that heyday <laughs> so i missed that i missed that period yeah, of time <laughs> i was i was online during it somehow i missed it too so oh. <laughs> Somehow I missed it. Um, but you mentioned branding and um, are there, uh, and how people should use their story as their brand, but are there other things that, um, that you usually think about for a good brand identity? I do. For one of my clients, it's funny, I just branded her last week and it's working already. She's already gotten referral clients just from the branding. I branded her as a bestie of a certain software program. So then she gets to be known in her circles as specializing in that software program. So it depends what industry you're in. It really does. But it can be as simple as that. As long as people already kind of have a feel for you and not your fresh face on the market who's never shown their stuff and fly by night. If you can niche yourself down into something really solid that there is a need for, there can be your your sex can be your success can be expedited. <laughs> okay. Well apparently I need to work more on my more on my niche then. Uh, <laughs> It depends on what field you're in. In her specific field, there is a need for a certain software program for help with a software program. So it depends what field you're in. It doesn't apply for every single field. I mean, there probably is something, something in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th um, one of the things that's been a trend over the last four or five years among people with disabilities is when I started this website, um, I took a lot of heat from people about using the word blind and uh, emphasizing that part of my story in my in my online presence and i actually lost some friends both sighted and visually impaired at the time for doing it but now five years later it's like it, it's like everybody is using um uh, expressions in their online personality that refers to like um i see a lot of people that will say wheelchair athlete or paralympic athlete or there's a lot of new hashtags and uh, social media profile names with the word uh, blind or low vision or, or blindness in them. And it's been interesting how that has changed. Um, other than niching down, are there any trends right now among branding that people should just totally avoid that that's not going to work or isn't working? I'm not a branding expert. I brand my clients based okay. on the businesses that we brought up. So I'm not going to talk for all brands. I can right. speak for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And again, that's something I get a feel for, for just over 20 years of business. So I do believe that the marketing has gone back to face-to-face. -face. And it's interesting that you brought up that when you brought up blind five years ago in that heyday of webinars and email marketing, where it was way less one-on-one, -on -one, you got a lot of flack. And nowadays where people want to connect with you and know you as the brand, you're not getting, you're seeing that as, as it's now completely acceptable. Yeah, funny to watch it change. Although some of, some of the friends are still aren't friends again. That's okay. But, uh, yes, that's okay. <laughs> yes, that's okay. Except for that one guy who gave me my start in podcasting, who I would really like to return my emails, but doesn't. So, but that's uh, that's that's my own personal stuff. I really shouldn't have mentioned that, but it that's happens. okay. That's part keep, of your brand, your personal stuff. Uh, yes, for you. yes. I keep telling people that I need one of those sheep dogs to run around in my brain and keep and and chase the bad ideas and bad expressions back into my head somewhere. You know, is no, you don't need to tell people that. Just wait until and say that later after the record button is off. You know, so. But yes, it. Um, 
which that actually leads me to a good question. I've had lots of discussions with coaches about um, when is um, too much authenticity. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that because you do work with people on using their, their story as their brand. I don't believe that there is a point on that. So I found it really strange that you that got flack about saying blind. And I believe that you should allow yourself to shine through. It's way more fun. It's way more authentic. <laughs> How are you going to connect to people if you don't let yourself shine through in your brand? However, if you are a more private person, then you have a right to share what you feel comfortable with. And at some point, if you aren't open with your audience there. I don't know what that point is. So it depends on your industry again, but at some point there, your people need to know, like, and trust you. If you're not sharing, they're not going to know, like, and trust you. That doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have a private life. So there is a fine line there. What that fine line is, I cannot determine for your business. Right. Well, I actually have two businesses. One, I help people sell surplus amusement equipment, which goes back to my days as a carnival owner. And in that community, I, they, you cannot share anything personal, not yours, not theirs, not people that have nothing to do with the, the industry if you happen to mention them. So you have to be really careful. And that's one of the reasons why when I had the option of, of running this website on that URL or on that, you know, combining the two or operating them separately, I was like, I know it'll be more work, but I got to have two websites because I had got to have this the one place where I'll ha if I want to say something personal, I don't have to worry about somebody or a lot of somebody's, you know, complaining. Oh, you really shouldn't say that, you know? Yeah, that's super limiting. That's definitely not a business world that I would want to be part of. I'm not downplaying for anybody else. That's just for me personal. That yes. that would that would feel stifling for me. It does. And it's uh it has to do with the fact that nobody in that industry or very few people in the industry trust each other so there's a lot of mm. a lot of competition a lot of lack mentality uh a lot of if they find out what i'm doing they'll use it against me kind of approaches to life so not everybody but a large enough number that i have to really watch my words over there which is probably why when i do my blog and my podcast i really just let it all go out there you know yeah, I totally hear you. I'm glad that you have a place for your authentic expression. And I'm definitely feel like there's more than enough for everyone. And I'm a strong believer in collaboration. I collaborate with fellow coaches all the time. I have a mindset coach coming into my group program this Friday to because some mindset stuff was coming up outside of the scope of what I want to offer my group program. So I have a mindset colleague of mine coming in to contain the space of people's money mindset and some confidence mindset. Yeah, I think a lot of people would do would would make more progress if they were willing to collaborate. But there again, that lack mindset tends to come in and the the concern about protecting your own business and your own clients and your own potential clients keeps people from working with others who would who could help them move move further ahead much more quickly. I find that, again, every industry is different. Just for me, when you're saying it to me, it makes me feel closed and small versus like big and open. <laughs> uh, I, I enjoy working with other, with other people and um, it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has a good, a good energy to it. You know, it just feels good to work with other people and to want them to succeed as much as, if not more than you, as long as their relationship is good for you at the same time. Oh, I agree with you. I, I feel like it has to be mutual. I also don't want to work with people who are just major takers and it's all about them. So I, I hear what you're saying. A good mutual collaboration where both parties benefit and feel good and support one another sounds great. Uh, a, a pretend collaboration where you do all the giving and somebody does all the taking, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's... And that's the, and of course, with the online, with the online world, um, we have to be uh, at least uh, maybe not, maybe cautious isn't the right word, but we have to be prudent because there are a lot of people out there who can be friendly, but um, we have to remember that doesn't mean that they are our, 
our friends or that they would have our best interests. But it, mm -hmm. at the same time, we can't let that keep us from relationships that would help us move forward. It's difficult. It's really hard. I hear what you're saying. I'm, I've been really fortunate in my business. Maybe I'm not open to that other kind of energy. I, when, when I experience <laughs> it, I'm repulsed by it and I don't even pay any attention to it. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's the benefit though. You're at the point where everybody wants to get to. You're at that point where you have been successful enough and you've done it by, uh, by paying your dues and, and doing the hard work. So you have earned the right to not have to not deal with anybody that doesn't that you don't want to you know you and because of all the experience you have you're pretty good at telling who those people are that's true i have paid my dues and i've had my fair share <laughs> of people i did not want to work with in my 20s so you're absolutely right and i i don't mean to sit on a high horse going oh don't work with those people when you need to go pay the bills i hear what yes. you're saying and you yeah, can retune your marketing maybe and try to magnetize the clients that you truly do want to work with. And some people, it's okay to say no. It's difficult to say no to money. I get it. It's still hard for me to say no to this day. And in the long run, it's going to keep you in business longer to say no to clients that are not a good fit, that don't feel right, that are not in integrity. They're going to be your pain in the butt clients that make you hate your job. Yes. And all of that, <laughs> All of that uh, affects how you, you know, when that, and when that starts to affect how you feel about your job, it, it means that you're less able to keep doing it. I like how we're starting to see people saying that uh, in a certain way, um, selfishness is almost necessary because if you're not, uh, if you're not nourishing yourself and protecting yourself, then you can't stay in business. You can't sustain what you're doing. You, you must nurture yourself. You must fill yourself up first. No one wants to work with an empty cup anyway. So the more full you come, the more full you are, the more abundant you come from. I mean, here's the truth. Here I am all these years later after paying my dues in my 20s and I no longer have to work and I magnetize my people to me because I am at ease about it. So the funniest thing is the less you can be obsessed with results, the more you can move into trust and really being of service and sharing your gifts with the world, the, the easier it actually is to be successful. Yes, but that is just goes against everything we've ever been taught since we could walk. <laughs> uh, well, maybe not that early because in kindergarten, they do teach you to share. So maybe everything we've taught since, uh, since elementary school. Oh, I'm not talking about sharing. I think that we lost tr train of thought with each other. So. Uh, well, as you, you were talking about being a service and bringing value. I said it, and the more you do that, the, the less, the less you have to, the less you uh -huh. have to, you know, and it's like, that goes against everything we've been taught. You know, it's, uh, we, as, as, especially in the U S and in, in the Western countries, it's like that goes against even, and even after several years now of having experts online telling us that that's the way to get it done, it's still just, doesn't sound right to most people. If you look at who has the majority of money and they're helping people on a wider scale, like I just was reading Forbes the other day and looking at Jeff Bezos's wealth, whether you like him or hate him or whatever about him, I, he serves a lot of people and you can see his hockey stick wealth over the, the years. And there, there is something be, to be said about serving a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Maxwell, is there a last question that you want to ask me before okay, we have so, to wrap up? Yes, right, right. So of all the things that you've learned in the last however many years it is that you've been in business for yourself, what is the one thing that you think will make the most difference in the people that are listening, make the most difference in their ability to actually move forward? It's to decide on success. That It's such a simple answer, and it's the truth. When you decide on success, 
and you make that decision. You're not wishing, you're not hoping, you're not wanting. You decided I am going to be successful. I am successful. That's going to bring about your consistent action on a daily basis. And that consistent action forward is what's going to bring you success. That's what's going to move you forward when things get messy and that there's failures and it's uncomfortable because all of those things are going to happen on your road to success. They're not possibly going to happen. They are going to happen. You are going to be challenged. So that firm decision to have that dream life, to have a successful business, that decision is going to, what's, it's going to move you forward consistently through that muck and through that mess to success. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. That's a great uh, thought for us to finish with. I've enjoyed talking with you today and I hope people will reach, uh, reach out to you. If they, if they do need the services that you're offering, they can find you at, at uh, sahmentrepreneur.com. And um, any websites or anything coming up you want to mention before you leave? That was my website, sahmentrepreneur.com. It has a free training to help you start your business. Okay, well, good. Uh, thank you, and uh, I really appreciate this. Take care. You too. Well, well, we had another great interview today. Um, I did feel a little lost because I was having to turn my screen reader off. If any of y'all have noticed a feedback noise in the past on my interviews, I'd appreciate it if you'd let me know. Um, surprisingly, it took five years for somebody to tell me that my video uh, camera setup was uh, was at an angle where it, you know, kind of distracted people. And I don't want to distract anybody from listening to the interview and from being inspired and motivated and challenged by my guests. So if y'all heard, if y'all ever hear something or see something that you think I need to know about, please let me know. Um, I will either check into it and say, thanks, I'll fix it. Or I'll check into it and say, thanks, no, you're wrong. Okay. So just, but let me know. Um, interesting that cat. Uh, has uh, been in several different uh, businesses that totally unrelated to each other, at least on the surface, but it sounds like some of the same methods, approaches, and mindsets have worked all along during the course of her business life and also work for her clients who she is uh, helping to start businesses where they can stay at home. Um, and I really am going to have to think more about my niche and getting more focused on who I help, how I help, and why. So. Uh, that was really good. And as y'all know, I often ask questions of a guest um, to, because I want to know the answer or because I'm personally looking for some help with my own stuff. So I am uh, really enjoyed the time that I got to spend with her. I hope that y'all enjoyed the interview and that each of you will decide on success, will decide that you are going to make your dreams and goals happen and that you're not going to allow any excuses. And uh, if you do have problems with excuses, then reach out to me at theblindblogger.net. Maybe I can help you overcome those excuses on a one-to-one -one basis. You can find me at theblindblogger.net, or you can reach out to me at justask at theblindblogger.net. Uh, on my website, uh, you can purchase the What's Your Excuse merchandise at the What's Your Excuse store, where else? And the latest two additions are the uh, shirts with the logos, both the suit and tie silhouette and the superhero cape silhouette. And uh, the website is Nito, let's see, it's netoshop.com slash artist slash the dash blind dash blogger. And the first letters of the blind and blogger are capitalized. So. And I mentioned him because um, Alex, the owner of Neato Shop, he always loves supporting his author, his artists, people who create uh, designs and sell them through his service. And he has uh, generously provided me with some shirts to take to an upcoming event. It's called Disability Insights. It'll be in Erie, Pennsylvania next week through Friday the 18th. And you can find out more about that at amybovard.com slash disability insights. But Alex has uh, generously provided some shirts 
if you want to get your logo on merchandise where you can sell it and, or give it away as a way of promoting your business, then I encourage you to reach out to Alex. That's neatoshop.com. And then don't forget about our good friends, Chip and Pam Edwards at createmyvoice.com where they will help get your, your blog and your podcast out there so people can find you on Alexa and Google and all the, uh, the wireless speakers that are coming down the road in the future. Uh, it's a huge audience. Literally millions of people who have these devices or who will be getting one soon. And they can find your content before they find other people's content. So if you're not there, you need to be there. Uh, reach out to Chip and Pam at createmyvoice.com. So until next time, I want to thank you for joining me. Without your support, I couldn't continue to do this. I really appreciate it. Until next time, thank you and take care out there. I am the blind blogger, Maxwell Ivy. Buck up, little buckaroo. Don't let the monkeys get to you. Hold on tight and you'll get through. Buck up, little buckaroo. Cheer up, little sunshine girl. There's lots of pain in this cruel world. Lots of rain falls on you, girl. Cheer up, little sunshine girl. Oh, it's gonna be all right. All right, I want you to know that you've come a long, 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 long way. And you've still got a long way to go.